All right, well, let's go ahead and read the passage that I was telling you about this morning. And then we will take a, uh, hopefully, a, um, a, a, a good look at it, uh, one that will give us a better understanding of what Jesus is saying, what he is pointing to, what he is commending to us. And I also hope by God's grace that he would enable all of us to take this on board, to receive it, and to, to do what it is he's calling us to do. Let's, we need to remember what James tells us, that we don't just look at the mirror of God's word or his law and then see you know, where our faults are and then walk away and forget what we've seen, but we need to, to do what we see. We need to try to, um, to work with the Lord as he shows us areas that, that we need to improve. Does anybody here not need to improve? I mean, then, you know, if that's the case, you don't need to listen to this. But I think most of us need to improve. So um, let's see what our Lord has for us in this passage. So let me read for you Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. <clears throat> now, he was also saying to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and this manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management, for you can no longer be manager. The manager said to himself, what shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I am not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do so that when I am removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. And he summoned one of his master's debtors, and he began saying to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. And his master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they will receive you into the eternal dwellings. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful, in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth." Well, may the Lord um, give us understanding of, of the passage that we've looked at. And I, I hope I've already given you enough of an understanding to be able to see at least the direction that I'm going with, with this, because I do believe that this, uh, that is really what the Lord is telling us here. <clears throat> well, let me begin, uh, begin by noting something that I think we're all acutely aware of, and that is the fact that we have passed another new year. I mean, what is today? The fifth, right? The fifth day of a brand new year. A day which, like basically a birthday or an anniversary, reminds us that time continues to move forward, the time that the Lord has given to us in this world, the time which I've already mentioned is actually very limited, which makes it also very precious. Now, when we run into these temporal reminders, you know, the reminders, again, that time is passing, it's always a good idea to make the best use of them by reflecting on whether we're using our time in the way that we should be using it, whether we're focusing on what is most important. Now, certainly it's important that, that we be safe, right? That we be saved, that we know that our souls are safe, that we've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, that God has actually forgiven us of all of our guilt, that we have eternal life. I don't think there's anything more important than this. So if you haven't used any of your time to trust in the Lord, I would encourage you to trust in Him this morning. I would invite you in His name to do so. Paul reminds us in Romans 10 verse 9, 
if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now again, that is the most important thing, but what is the second most important thing if you have already trusted in him? Well, I think the answer, if we can use sort of a broad rubric, and that would be faithfulness. That we be faithful to use what the Lord has given to us, what he has entrusted to us for his glory, which would include everything that we have. Basically, our time, our lives, right? Our strength, our resources, and our gifts. Now, we should do this because, obviously, from these two parables, this is what the Lord is telling us that we should do. This is what he calls us to do. This is our duty. And duty is a four-letter word, but it's not a bad word, is it, okay? But it's one that many Christians today see as a bad word. But we do need to understand that whenever the Lord calls us to do, whatever our duty is, is always something good, and it is good for us. And this certainly is no exception. And that's also why uh, we need to understand there's other reasons why the Lord calls us to do this. And again, these are the ones for our benefit and our good. Faithfulness is one of the evidences that we actually do belong to Jesus, right? If we were dead and now we're alive, there should be some changes that take place in our lives. Now, we can say that we believe that Jesus is our Lord, as Paul tells us to do, and that God raised him from the dead. But if our service to our Lord doesn't go beyond Sundays, if we don't really think about him the rest of the week or give him a second thought, if we're not giving him our whole week, if we're not giving him our whole lives, then we're not being faithful, right? Because... We are to be stewards of all the Lord has given to us and to be putting it to his use. Jonathan Edwards reminds us that the love that the Spirit of God puts in our heart is not a love that is indistinguishable from the love that the world has. It's not something that changes us just a little bit. It's not something that moves us just maybe a degree or two beyond perfect indifference. But rather, it is a holy fire, a zeal for the glory of God. Listen to what Paul writes to Titus in Titus 2.14. He says that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Notice, zealous for good deeds. Okay, this is why the Lord redeemed us and he gave us the Holy Spirit so that we might be zealous. Now, we all recognize that it's possible for us to fall into situations where the love and the zeal that he has given to us becomes weak, but it can't be weak all the time, right? That's not what a Christian is like. We do need to remember what Jesus said to the church at Laodicea in Revelation 3, verses 15 through 16. And I believe that these are perhaps the most sobering words we find in all of Scripture, and I do believe they mean exactly what they say. Jesus says to that church, to those people professing faith in his name, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot, not, not completely indifferent, but you're not zealous for me either. I wish that you were cold and indifferent or hot and zealous. So because you were lukewarm, somewhere in between, and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be spit out of the Lord's mouth. The thing is, if you're a believer, you're not going to be spit out of his mouth. But if you're a believer, you're going to be hot and not lukewarm. Certainly, you're not going to be cold, right? Because that only describes unbelievers. But lukewarm also describes that, okay? Our love needs to be hot. And a hot love is what produces faithfulness. But now we also need to understand what we also looked at already this morning, that faithfulness is important for another reason. One day, our Lord is going to call us to account for our stewardship. Again, as we saw in our meditation, Paul writes to the church of Corinth, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us may be recompensed for his deeds, that, that means the things we've done, in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And I think the parable of the talents that we looked at this morning basically reminds us of the same thing. 
what we do in this world makes a difference. How faithful we are with our stewardship will determine what it is we're going to receive from the Lord on that day. So again, we need to think about this seriously. Now this morning, Jesus addresses all these points, but he also tells us how to use the stewardship that he has given to us to its best advantage. I mean, what does the Lord want us to do? Well, that's what he explains in this parable, which is, again, a very interesting parable. So he begins by giving his disciples this parable, which he doesn't actually fully explain. But I think it was obvious, to, at least to them, what it meant, and hopefully it'll be obvious to, well, uh, to us as well. But what he says is there was a certain manager, uh, um, excuse me, there was, okay, a manager who had squandered or basically wasted his master's possessions. He wasn't taking what the master had entrusted to him and using it in the best way possible. In other words, he wasn't making any profit for his master. Instead, he was losing money for his master, like the servant, by the way, who had the one talent. Remember, he took it and buried it, and at least it wasn't squandered, but yet it was squandered because it could have been making a profit, right? So here is an unprofitable servant. Now, learning of this, his master calls him to give a final accounting of his stewardship because he may no longer hold this position. Now, the steward is faced with a dilemma. He knows that he's soon going to be out of work. He knows that with his failure in this area, no one is going to hire him into a similar position. Nobody wants an unfaithful steward who's going to be squandering their resources. He realizes he's not strong enough to do common labor, which is basically what most of the jobs would be available to him, but also that he's too ashamed to depend on the charity of others to survive. So what can he do to do something about this before he loses his position? Well, he realizes he needs to use his stewardship the authority that he still has over his master's wealth to his advantage before he gives it up. So he calls in his master's debtors and he asks them what they owe and then he authorizes them to reduce the amounts. In other words, he's giving them money, okay? He's, he's lessening their debts, which means more money in, in their pocket. He uses the position that he has to help them so that when he loses his position, they will be inclined to help him. Now, when his master learns what he's done, he praises the steward. I think this is probably one of the things that's most confusing about, about this parable. Why would the master praise somebody who's squandering his money to begin with, who has just reduced the debts of his debtors and taken away his wealth? Well, we do need to um, pay attention to the fact that he wasn't praising him for stealing, okay? That was not the virtuous thing that he did. Instead, he praised him because of how shrewdly or how wisely he had acted being in this position. Now, to understand the parable um, and why Jesus said it, okay, uh, we need to see that this is the point that Jesus is actually zeroing in on, how it is the servant, the steward, basically used what he had to get out of the situation. Notice he says in verses 8 and 9, the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. And I say to you, disciples, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness so that when it fails, they will receive you into the eternal dwellings. Now, what he says here certainly sounds confusing. So let's think about what he means and what he doesn't mean by this, okay? Obviously, Jesus is not commending the fact that the steward stole from his master. He's, he's not telling us that we should be cheating or stealing from our employers and basically give what we're taking from them to others like Robin Hood so that they will be indebted to us. I mean, the, the commandments say, you shall not steal, right? And Jesus tells us that we need to be faithful to our masters. He's certainly not telling us, and it almost sounds like he is, this is the most confusing thing, 
that if we were to do something like this, that somehow those we helped would be able to help us get into the eternal dwelling, that is, into heaven. Well, we know that salvation doesn't come by cheating others and, and helping others, and people on earth can't help us get into heaven, obviously. So what is Jesus actually saying? Well, what he's telling us here is this, that we need to use the stewardship that he's given to us, the one he has given, in the same way that this man used his to use that stewardship to prepare for the future. I mean, we, when, when Jesus spoke to his disciples, and as he's speaking to us this morning, we are actually in the same position as the steward or the servant in this parable. We are the stewards of our Lord. He's the master, we are the stewards. Everything that we have belongs to him. You know, we really can't claim anything to be our own. You know, uh, even if we have, like, say, glasses that are, are written to our prescription, these don't belong to me. They belong to the Lord. Everything that we have belongs to him. Um, and essentially, the Lord has given us all that we have in order to use these things to make a profit for him. But the way that we do it is by using what he has given to us to help other people, okay? The way the steward benefited the other people, you know, that was an act of shrewdness. Jesus says, we need to use what we have to benefit other people. That's why he has given us the things that he has. Do you realize that's the reason why he gave us his gospel? You know, he gave the gospel to us so that we could be saved, but he also gave it to us so that we could give it away to others to help them. That's why he gave us the strength that he's given to us. That's why he gives us the work that he's given us to do so that we could gain resources. And with those resources, not only take care of our own needs and the needs of our families, but also the needs of, of others. I don't know whether you, you take the time to read the quotes that are in the bulletin, um, but actually try to match these with the theme that we're, we're looking at. And uh, there's a couple of good um, quotes in here that I would just draw your attention to. Uh, the first one by John Bunyan, he says, You have not lived until you have done something for someone who can never repay you. That The greatest, more blessed to give than to receive, isn't it? And, you know, Jesus reminds us that sinners give to sinners that they might receive back from them, but they, they give it so they can get something back. When you give to somebody who can't give back, that is where the true blessing lies. And then this more challenging quote from Augustine, find out how much God has given you and from it take what you need, the remainder is needed by others. Um, we don't think along those lines because you know, we're afraid that we're not going to have what we need, but the Lord has promised he's going to meet those needs and we need to pay attention to the fact that he gives us what he gives us, not only for ourselves, but also for others. That's also why he gave us spiritual gifts, right? They weren't just for ourselves to benefit us, but we are to use them to benefit one another. Now, really, everything that we're talking about here is implied or actually expressly said in the, the second greatest commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is telling us that's what he wants us to do, is love our neighbor with the things he has given to us. But the Lord spells it out in this parable more clearly. Okay? When Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 that we are so many different parts of a body and that we are to use these parts, we all, don't all have the same function, but we all have the same purpose, and that purpose is to use what God has given to us to serve one another and to serve others. So when he tells us that we are the Lord's hands and his feet, he, we are his eyes and his ears, we are his mouth, we are basically how the Lord does his work in this world, He's not using a meaningless analogy. He, he's simply telling us this is what we are in Christ. And so we need to be faithful. Now, we noted at the beginning that faithfulness is really, it, it's not the means by which we're saved, okay? It is a test of genuineness. It's one of the many ways that we can know that we belong to Jesus when Jesus tells us, this is true of those who know me, we're supposed to take what he says and compare ourselves to that. 
And even though we know we're always going to fall short of, of what it is we're called to be, the fact is if we didn't have any of that in our lives, well, we wouldn't belong to him. But if we do, we will have something of it. And that is what we are to be looking for. Faithfulness is one of those things. It shows us that we basically are the heirs of the kingdom of heaven. It shows us that we have eternal life. Jesus goes on to tell us that faithfulness is something that will characterize our lives if we belong to him, whether we have a lot or whether we have a little. And of course, faithlessness shows just the opposite. He says in verse 10, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. He's telling us basically if we have the Spirit in our lives, if we have His love working within us, we will be faithful whether we have a little or a lot because our character will be that of faithfulness. You know that as you look at the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, one of the fruits of the Spirit is faithfulness. Now, we're not going to be perfectly faithful, as I've said, but we will be consistently faithful. Faithfulness basically means consistency, doesn't it? Is that we, we keep at it. We keep doing what the Lord has called us to do. We don't just do it in spurts and stops, as it were, or maybe never even try. But we do what the Lord has called us to do and take what He's take, given us to, to do it with, and we do it consistently. Uh, Jesus says even more clearly that this faithfulness is the prerequisite to receiving heaven. Listen to what he says in verse 11. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, and by the way, it doesn't mean wealth unrighteously gained, but he's talking about what's been entrusted to us, basically filthy lucre, uh, the money of this world, the things that we need. He says, if you haven't been faithful in your use of that, who will entrust the true riches to you? Okay, so here's a steward who isn't being faithful. I'm not going to give you anything more. I'm not going to entrust what I have to you. Jesus is telling us the same thing, right? So faithfulness is a prerequisite to entry into heaven, but it is a prerequisite that the Lord gives to us by the Holy Spirit. And then he says further, something else very interesting if we're not faithful to use what he has given us to profit him, we won't receive a reward. And the interesting thing he says about this reward is that this reward is the one thing out of everything that, that we think we possess now, which really belongs to the Lord, okay? This reward that we will receive is the only thing for all time that we can actually say belongs to us. Isn't that interesting? If we are faithful with, what, with the Lord's goods, with His resources, the Lord will give us something that we can call our own. He says in verse 12, And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Okay, now we turn that around to put it in a more positive way. If you have been faithful with what I have given you, then I will give you that which is your own. Now, Jesus said the same thing in the parable of the talents. The master, remember, received the two that were faithful and gave them a reward, something that would belong to them. But he cast the one who wasn't faithful into the outer darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, again, Jesus is not telling us here that we need to earn our way into heaven. Um, again, that would be to reduce the gospel to a works-based salvation. We can't look at it in those terms, and I don't know how many people do look at it in those terms, but let's also consider the concept, or basically the, the ramifications of what it does mean if we belong to Him, if we have trusted Him, if we have the Spirit working in our hearts, we will be faithful. Okay, not perfectly faithful, but consistently faithful. Faithfulness is one of the many evidences that we do belong to Him. And because we belong to Him, we will receive the inheritance. We will receive the reward. He will give us something that belongs to us. 
Now, if we belong to the Lord and we have this faithfulness, we do need to also ask the question, how can we be more faithful than we are? Because I think we all understood this morning or confessed by not raising our hands that we haven't made it, right? There's still room for improvement. So how can we become more faithful? And I think you know the answer to that is by overcoming the desires, the contrary desires that get in our way. And I believe that's what Jesus addresses in verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Now, I mean, I think that's pretty clear. Don't you understand what he's saying? The two are opposed. If, if the Lord gives you wealth and He wants you to use it for others, but you can't give it away because you love the wealth too much, well, then you're not serving God. It's, you can't serve two opposing principles. One of them is going to win out. The reason the rich young ruler couldn't follow Jesus, what was the reason? And the reason he fell short of entering into the kingdom was because he couldn't let go of the wealth that he had. When Jesus called him to do so for the good of others. You remember what he said to him? He goes, sell all that you have, give it to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And he, and he went away grieved because he had so much. And he couldn't let go of it. You can't serve God and wealth. Paul writes, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, Jesus isn't saying it's a bad thing to have money. He gives us money, right? He gives us money to take care of our needs. He wants us to have money. That's the reason why we have it. But what he's telling us here is that we can't just hold on to it all the time. He, he gave us what we needed to take care of our needs, and he also gave us something to give to others. That's what the unrighteous steward did, right? He gave to others. Now, Jesus tells us that in order to be faithful stewards, we need to be sanctified. Well, that shouldn't come as any surprise, right? We need to be freed from the desires, every desire that gets in our way of doing what the Lord calls us to do. I mean, isn't that uh, the reason we don't do more of what our Lord calls us to do is because there's something we want to do more than that. Maybe we're afraid to do what he calls us to do, but when it comes to, again, helping others, maybe there's something we'd rather use that money for. That's the reason why Paul tells us we need to put the deeds of the flesh to death. Those things are getting in our way. So how can we do it? Well, first of all, we need to understand we, we can't do it on our own. Remember what um, when the rich young ruler went away and Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, you know, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And the eye of a needle may have been bigger in those days, right? But still no camel's going to get through it. But it's easier for the camel to get through that eye than for a rich man to enter into heaven. And the disciples said, if that's the case, then who can be saved? I mean, which one of us are going to get into heaven? What did Jesus say? With people, this is impossible. But with God... All things are possible. We can't do this in our own strength, but we can with the Spirit's help. That's the reason why Jesus came into the world, to live and to die and to rise again so that he could give to us his Holy Spirit. And if we have the Spirit, we really have everything we need. Everything we need to do what the Lord has called us to do. But again, I would remind all of us here this morning, we're not going to have the strength that the Lord actually has promised to us <clears throat> unless we also do certain things. What are, what are those things? You probably heard me re re uh, re rehearse the list enough times to be able to recite it on your own. But we do need to read the Word. We need to be immersed in it. Why? Because living in this world, we forget who we are. We forget what we're all about. We forget what the Lord says. Our flesh is constantly working against us. If we are not in the Word of God, we are not going to be sanctified, and we're not going to find the strength that we need. We need to pray and ask for His help. Jesus says you don't have because you don't ask. 
And of course, we need to ask also with the right motives. We need to pray and ask for His strength and for His help. We need also to yield to the Spirit of God when we finally get that help and we're going along in life and we see something that we know this is what the Lord wants us to do. The Spirit of God is going to remind us and He's going to move us in that direction. And at that particular point, we need to yield to Him and do what He's telling us to do instead of resisting Him and then walking away grieved because we didn't do what the Lord called us to do. You know, that's probably the most important thing right there and the, the place where we most often fail. If we would just simply give in to what we know the Spirit of God has called us to do, we would be so much stronger. And that strength lasts only as long as we actually are walking with the Holy Spirit and yielding to Him. So if we do these things, and of course this would include our worship, our fellowship, and all these other things, then it will strengthen our faithfulness. Now again, let me just remind you, if you have the Spirit of God, you have everything you need. You just simply need to use the means that He has given to you. I need to use these means to be stronger in the Word. But answering the question, what if you look at yourself and you don't see any faithfulness? What if it, your life shows you don't have the Spirit? Well, then you need to realize, again, this is not something you can do on your own, is it? You can't be faithful enough to get into heaven, just like you can't keep the commandments well enough to get into heaven. You need Jesus. You need to come to Jesus. You need to ask Jesus for his help. He's the one who has the spirit to give, and only he does. So if that's your situation, that's where you need to start. Come to Jesus in order that you might be saved. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to uh, take, again, very sobering words that we've heard this morning, but hopefully encouraging words, because we can be more faithful if we simply do what our Lord calls us to do. Let's pray that the Lord would help us to be more faithful.